Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. The Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, which borders Syria, Iraq, Israel, and Saudi Arabia, is a key partner in the U.S.-led coalition battling the Islamic State and is the first Arab state to actively participate in the coalition's aerial campaign against the extreme Muslim group. Jordan has also become the host country for the annual exercise of the U.S.-led coalition, bringing some 20 nations together to conduct advanced drills that bolster the anti-Islamic state's cooperation mechanism. To further discuss this topic, I'm joined here in the studio by Professor Hillel Frisch, who is a senior researcher at Bessa Center at Bar Ilan University. Welcome. Hi. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and Dr. Nir Bons, who is a research fellow at the Moshe Dayan Center at Tel Aviv University. Mr. Oren, give us a broader understanding of the key role that Jordan is playing in this battle against the Islamic State. Well, Jonathan, you ticked off the neighboring uh, states. In addition to those uh, four, you have the Palestinian Authority and you have a cross from the uh, Red Sea. You have Egypt, not uh, adjacent uh, to Jordan, but nevertheless a very short distance from it. And you have the Islamic State not only across the border in Syria, but also perhaps penetrating Jordan. And now some of the fighters wanting to go back into Syria to help their comrades who are beleaguered. So Jordan has a lot on its plate, and it is one of the two Arab countries with a peace treaty uh, with Israel. Israel considers it an excellent security partner. And right now, what is happening in the south of Syria, not far from the Iraqi border at the uh, Rutba area, a place, by the way, where the uh, Scud missiles have been launched from, against Israel in 1991, this is one of the hotspots in the coalition-led warfare in Syria. Professor Frisch? There's another hotspot, it's called Al-Tanif, which is um, close also between the Syrian and Jordanian um, border. And that's very, very important because one of the secu major security problems that Jordan faces is the Shiite crescent that Iran wants to restore to the pre-2011 um, um, situation, which extended from Tehran to Beirut, and that ref reflects a tremendous um, threat to Jordan. And the Americans recently operated by killing um, Syrian mi militias, Hezbollah, and Syrian officers who tried mm -hmm. linking up with pro-Iraq, pro-Iranian Iraqi militias mm -hmm. to restore that presence. And we'll uh, come back to that topic, but uh, Dr. Bums, uh, your uh, insight on the matter? Well, Jordan is the buffer state. It's the buffer zone. It is the border between the stabilized Middle East as it remains and the destabilizing Middle East. And in many ways, Jordan has been an ally, uh, certainly to the United States, to Israel, and to the other moderate axis in the region. Uh, and Jordan has been also one of the first victims of the Arab Spring and certainly the Syria crisis, not in a sense of the Jordanian stability itself uh, in terms of the political upheavals. There has been you know, some traction there, but the, the, the kingdom has remained stable, and we can speak more about why that is the case. But with over 1.3 million Syrian refugees following uh, the previous wave of Iraqi refugees and the Palestinian refugees, uh, the stability of Jordan is important, and Jordan needs to play its cards correctly, use its alliances correctly, and it is trying to do so, but really speaking with everyone, with the Russians, with the Americans, uh, with the Israelis, with the Egyptians, uh, in, in a roundabout way, uh, probably with others, in a very quiet Jordanian way, uh, as Jordan has done uh, wisely uh, to keep uh, its interest and to keep its stability. Nevertheless, Mr. Oren, when we're talking about Jordan, it has taken extra effort to battle the Islamic State, which has, of course, uh, also uh, claimed some responsibilities for killings in Jordan, also outside of Jordan, against uh, Jordanian nationals. Do you believe that uh, the Jordanian participation in this uh, operation against the Islamic State has emboldened it within the international community as a key partner of the West, of various countries, in decision-making of the region? Indeed it did, and uh, if you look at uh, the uh, two um, younger, relatively young rulers who have taken over from the fathers late um, in the last uh, century or last millennium, you have Bashar Assad who took over in June of the year 2000. 
And uh, a year or so earlier, you have King Abdallah, who took over from Hussein. Both of the uh, long-time rulers died uh, from illness uh, at this time. Bashar Assad did not manage to keep his country together. And King Abdallah, who was uh, looked down on when he uh, first uh, ascended to the uh, throne, uh, now looks uh, as uh, quite astute because he has managed to uh, deliver to the West Jordan's ability to project forces beyond its borders in the cause, in the common cause of the moderate Arab countries, moderate Sunni Arab countries, and the West. And therefore, when he let uh, the Americans not only use Jordan as a base, but also cooperate with special forces and the Air Force and other uh, Jordanian military units, he showed that uh, Jordan is a very reliable partner. Professor Frisch? I think um, that, that Jordan is really a buffer state. And in that sense, it commands the support generally of a host of Western um, countries that are very, very interested in, in promoting its stability. And um, I think that um, most of the maneuvers and, and, centering, and centering the exercises in Jordan is a way of promoting Jordanian stability. The king which himself is, really is half Western with a right. British mother. Right, and that was seen as a tremendous mm -hmm. liability because he was the only Arab leader that had an, a Western, uh, ha, had an English accent when he spoke Arabic. Mm. I mean, maybe a hundred years ago, that wouldn't have been quite, um, I, I mean, the, the, the monarchs of Egypt spoke Turkish. Mm. But for the last 70 years, the leaders have spoken Arabic. And suddenly this guy came in who was more British than, than, than Arab, and yet he has been very, very mm -hmm. astute in continuing to promote basically what King Hussein, his father, built up. Dr. Bones? Well, we need to remember that the British connection to Jordan is old. The military has been really built up uh, by, by the British, so some of it is not entirely surprising. And really the Jordanians, just like other countries in the region, needed to, when you're looking at the Arab Spring, needed to maneuver between very uneasy circumstances. Jordan, like many of the Arab countries, is also a mixed country, is not a homogeneous country. Uh, the, the two main groups, uh, the Bedouins uh, and the Palestinians, the Bedouins uh, are the minority, the Palestinians are the majority, and that's the king that represents the old order that was given to him uh, by, uh, the, that was given to Jordan by, by the British. Uh, and again, looking at the minority that needs to maneuver uh, now with a majority of a population that is not necessarily with the same ethnic base, and now with whole sets of groups of refugees, they needed to do a number of things in order to create a certain degree of cohesion in Jordan. And they have done this uh, successfully, relatively speaking, uh, certainly within, if you compare it to the context of the other countries around them. Uh, then the success uh, of Jordan is part of what brings the Jordanians um, to be a loyal ally. They're able to keep stability with circumstances that are not easy. Uh, and they're able to do so by bringing some of the allies in. Remember, we need to remember that in the last four years, we have the mock, uh, a headquarter in where the Americans predominantly and now others are coordinating some of the work done in Syria from Jordan. And we have a training center, actually the most advanced uh, foreign training centers for commandos uh, is based in the northern part of Jordan, operated by the American military. Uh, the recent exercise, um, Eager Lion, is just one example, but exercises as such have been taking place since 2011. And this is a very clear indication uh, that Jordan is not alone. Mr. Owen, when we're hearing about uh, Jordan right now, we hear over and over again, it is a buffer state between Western countries and Western civilization for that ma uh, matter and the eastern states and the danger of the radical Islamic uh, terrorism, militant groups, and so on. Do you believe that uh, the fact that Jordan is such a significant country that protects, in other words, also the state of Israel to a certain degree and also other countries, uh, is that the reason why now the United States raised also the, the funding for its military and has really provided Jordan with new qualitative weapons in order to maintain their ability to withstand uh, various challenges? Well, as Dr. Bums uh, stated, uh, Great Britain used to be 
Jordan's main stalwart. It uh, created the artificial entity called Transjordan and then the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. On a Sunday afternoon with a stroke of Churchill's diary. Yes, out, out of the <coughs> desert. And by the way, there's an irony here because the um, present Jordanians um, were, uh, in a way, rewarded for their service during uh, World War I, where they acted, um, according to Lawrence of Arabia's uh, uh, memoirs, out of the desert, raiding the, the Turkish and uh, others. And today, they are fighting the Islamic State's raiding parties, especially near this Altanif uh, area, where there is no regular force for the Islamic State, but they come out of the desert, they hit, they go back, and the Jordanians are uh, very um, uh, skilled in fighting those uh, forces. Now, as, as for your uh, uh, question, uh, Jordan has always uh, had to walk a very, a very delicate balance between the Palestinians and the Bedouins. Um, right before the Six Day War, and we're now marking the 50th anniversary, there was fear in the United States, and you asked about the United States, which took over from Britain in the late 1950s. The United States had to, to uh, decide whether to sell Jordan arms, that is fighter planes and tanks, or uh, or else tell Israel, neither Israel nor Jordan will get it. And what the president of the time, President Johnson said, was that King Hussein had a million and a half inhabitants in Jordan. Only half a million were loyal to him. The other million, the Palestinians, were against him. So it turned out that by losing the West Bank and East Jerusalem, King Hussein ba managed to balance Jordan. It was a net gain from him. Uh, of course, uh, he, he was very sorry to have lost the western part of his country. But now that he is controlling, that Abdallah is controlling only the east bank of the Jordan River, Jordan can serve as a cohesive country, able to safeguard Israel's flank as well as uh, uh, serve the west. Two comments. First, um, there's one further dimension, very important dimension, to being a buffer state. It's a buffer state now between the Shiite crescent and the Sunni moderate states. And, and this has become very, very important in, in the last decade. And I think that uh, the American weapon program for Jordan is not to deal with the Islamic State, which is, which is declining, but basically the increasing Iranian presence in Syria and the re-strengthening of the Syrian state. That's why, why, why they need conventional military capabilities. And that's the aim of um, the, the, the transaction. Dr. Bombs? Uh, Jordan, we need to remember, has been uh, very hospitable and in many ways uh, surprisingly so. I mean, it was the, served as the spillover of all the regional conflicts uh, in Iraq, the conflict with Israel, now the conflict in Syria. It absorbed all the people uh, up to the point that it was very difficult for Jordan itself to uh, continue this absorption and to continue its stability. It was able to do so certainly with lots of help. Uh, and part of it is connected to what uh, Mr. Oren had said before. Well, uh, Jordan said, if, if we are able to create a more heterogeneous state in some degree, then we're able to make a stronger case for Jordan and for the stability because all the parties, uh, certainly the Palestinians, who actually have emerged, unlike the Palestinians in Lebanon, unlike the Palestinians in Syria, have emerged in many ways the, those who are more privileged within the society, those who are uh, very much part and parcel of the first sector, and in many ways they've remained Jordanians. And the slogan, Jordan uh, and all you know, Jordan comes first, and we are all Jordanians, um, uh, actually survived. And all, then you have a, a situation in Jordan in where the different factions actually would like to see the stability because they understand the alternatives. The Palestinians understand what it is when you are able to be governed by, just by Palestinians, certainly by radical Palestinians. They need to see it not so far away from them, certainly in Gaza and a little differently in the West Bank. They are also able to see what's happening in Syria and what is happening in Iraq. So they understand that the buffer zone is extremely important. Uh, and with this, uh, Jordan is able to uh, uh, prove its vitality and its 
importance. Mm -hmm. uh, and what, what's, what we're seeing on the ground is also a, a way of Todogenian are saying, look, we're not trying to yell or to play a first fiddle here. Uh, we're able to do what we're doing relatively quietly. Uh, we're not trying to get too many Americans in. If there are, there's some, some involvement, okay, so we have an international exercise. Uh, we're able to do things relatively quietly, uh, coordinate things from outside. Uh, the Jordanians, for example, insisted that the Americans are not going to use their military bases in order to uh, conduct the bombings. They're still being conducted by um, flights uh, from the ships overseas in order to make sure that you know the Jordanians or uh, the kingdom is able to say to its own people look we are having the situation under control uh, they closed the border when they felt they need to close the border um, and they understand that if they would not be able to sort the Syria crisis and if this one of these plans of safe zones or de-conflict zones is not going to work out, then there's not going to be an end to this. And the spillover will continue. Jordan needs to find a solution to bring some of these refugees back. And therefore, the interest uh, in El Tanaf and in the south part uh, uh, of, of Syria, which is also the border between Jordan and Israel, is to continue this process of de-escalation, of de-conflictualizations, and bring some of the civilian life back in it. The most significant development with this issue of El Tanef is the opening of the border crossing, one of three official ones, into civilian traffic, into merchant traffic. And this is uh, the most significant indication that mm. the idea and the direction is uh, uh, to bring back some degree of routine and de-escalate the conflict. Let, let, me, let me add something shortly. To, to the, to the Altanev uh, issue. This is uh, the southeastern Syrian security belt. Mm -hmm. The Jordanians and the Americans, and there are Americans there, which is why they attacked the convoy, uh, and they, they uh, uh, said that this was for false protection. But this is the southeastern security belt, while the Turks have been conducted a sort of a northwestern, or northern at least, security belt of their own in order to isolate Syria from further encroaching by Islamic State fighters mm. from Iraq or from wherever. Nevertheless, there are plenty of concerns in Amman regarding the situation also right now in Raqqa, where they believe that once Raqqa falls from the rule of the Islamic State, a lot of the militants will start moving southwards towards the border region with Jordan and even try to infiltrate Jordan. Do you believe that Jordan will make an operation of its own in order to thwart such an attempt? Uh, Jordan will uh, support operations by uh, the American-led coalition and by indigenous forces, the Kurds and others. And uh, the uh, stated American aim is to kill the foreign fighters and others, not to take them prisoner, not to let them exfiltrate from Raqqa, but rather to hunt them down and kill them all. And the Jordanians are going to be as ruthless as the Islamic State has been towards their own forces, uh, notably their fighter pilot, um, whom, Who was whom they murdered uh, yeah. uh, so horrifically. So, so uh, uh, Jordan will probably, we, we have to see, but will probably not send a unit of its own to fight as boots on the ground, but will support it uh, as uh, the uh, uh, second echelon. Professor well, Fush. Uh, I'd, I'd like to, uh, I think that the Jordan is a, in a very favorable position because it knows how to keep the foreign fighters out. What it was worried about were the sleeper cells within Jordan. And when Islamic State was rising, there was a, there was a real danger that terrorism would turn out into open rebellion. And that was dangerous. I think that's receded. The, the problem with foreign, the inf influx of foreign fighters is something that the Jordanians can control. And this very important signaling of the Trump administration, this attack in Al Tanif, I think was a, of historical importance. It meant the American administration was signaling to Iran and to Syria that they would not allow the reestablishment of the Shiite crescent. And for Jordan, that was great news. Dr. Bombs? Just last week, another uh, official report, the Jordanian news agency, uh, two uh, what they say is drug uh, dealers were killed in the border trying to penetrate the border. This is part of the ISIS dimension. This is part of the attempt to compromise the border, and this is part of the Jordanian uh, effort to make sure the border is 
guarded. And they have done this relatively late after again over 1.3 million uh, refugees have entered. And they're saying, look, now we understand that the situation is becoming more difficult. We're not going to let anyone in. The second important point here, which is also very uh, uh, wise uh, and uh, perhaps a compliment uh, to, uh, to the king, Jordan is able to keep good relationship with all the parties involved. Uh, the king had visited since its uh, 1999, 19 times in Moscow. Vladimir Putin, his first foreign trip after his election and the second time in 2012 was to Amman. The Americans and the Russians are able to sit and speak in Jordan and coordinate to a certain degree what they're able to coordinate. They're obviously not agreeing on all things, but still using Jordan uh, as a part of the buffer state, trying to, to uh, uh, I guess, at least minimize damage. All of this is happening very quietly without Jordan taking the lead role, without Jordan taking the front. This is perhaps part of the Jordanian wisdom and part of what enabled it to survive so far. Even uh, President Trump uh, invited uh, the King Abdullah to come to Washington, the first Arab leader, of course, to visit uh, the American uh, leader after his election, even before Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. How much of a relationship is this between the Jordanian king and President Trump? Well, apparently President Trump likes monarchs. Um, he has enjoyed uh, the hospitality of the uh, House of Saud, and uh, he sees uh, King Abdallah as uh, a very important interlocutor. Obviously, before he met uh, King Abdallah, he uh, was more favorable towards Prime Minister Netanyahu's uh, policy aims, and uh, he stepped back uh, and uh, reconsidered uh, because uh, King Abdallah told him that uh, even though the uh, Palestinian-Israeli conflict is not now the most salient issue in the region, nevertheless, there must be progress in it. And apparently, the administration uh, took it to heart. But there's another point, um, an ironical one. Jordan and Lebanon used to be, or at least to be considered, the two weakest Arab countries when everybody looked up to Egypt and Iraq and Syria and perhaps Saudi Arabia, Jordan and, and uh, Lebanon um, were the orphans. And it turns out now that both of them ha have stood uh, the uh, test of time and are uh, relatively stable. So apparently uh, they are doing something right. Mm -hmm. Professor Frisch, when the, we're the looking on- it looks beyond the Jordanian border the better it is for the Jordanian. So it seems. When we're talking about the Iranian uh, uh, alliance with uh, the various Shiite militias and also with President Bashar Assad, we see a certain uh, change and shift within Syria, also with the Iraqi Shiite militias now controlling some of the border region between Iraq and Syria and trying to uh, reach also Assad's uh, forces and their allies there in uh, the uh, uh, other regions where they're operating, of course, the Kurdish uh, forces are in, uh, in between currently, and we don't really know how that's going to play out. But how do you see Jordan actually look toward that situation when so many Iranian forces that haven't been in Syria up until now suddenly are heading that way and will effectively bolster Assad's uh, power times two or even more? It was mentioned that um, the Jordanian king has good relations with everyone, but there are two exceptions, and one notable exception. Jordan has always taken an anti-Iranian line throughout, throughout the Arab Spring and, and, and the recent rise of the, of, the Islamic, of the Islamic State. I mean, it's really hostile to, to um, I Iran, and it opposes, it opposes the strengthening of the Syria. Is that on a religious of the, of the uh, level? No, it's, um, it, it feels threatened. It's, it feels threatened by this Shiite crescent, and, and indeed so, because it's, it's, uh, it, it shares borders with Iraq, it shares borders, uh, borders with Syria, and also it receives tremendous economic support mm -hmm. from the, the Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. So it's, it's, both, it's both religious, economic, and geo and geo um, strategic, mm -hmm. and um, but but under the Trump administration, given the radical change between Trump and Obama, 
I am sure that the Jordanians feel better secured. Dr. Bums? Well, the <coughs> Sunni Shia split is certainly a significant one. And when you have a king that uh, is a part uh, of the lineage of the prophet, that makes it somewhat more symbolic. But I think I agree with uh, Professor Frisch that this is more political in nature. The main interest of Jordan is stability. It is very clear that Iran brings the opposite to the region. And it's very clear that the lack of stability threatens Jordan. So what Jordan seeks uh, to do, if it can, is to influence the stability that can be brought. To minimize friction, this is partially what is able to do when it's able to host uh, and at least create some dialogues between the different parties that are involved in the regional conflict. And I very much assume uh, that this idea of the zones, the safe zones, the de-escalation zone, the, the decrease of conflict, and the American involvement is something that uh, uh, might have risen in some of the conversations with Jordanians because this is a very clear Jordanian interest. It is very clear Jordanian interest that ISIS are going to be pushed back, that Iran is going to be pushed back, and that some degree of stability could be restored. Even if Syria is going to be at least uh, de facto semi-partitioned. Uh, well, we're drawing to uh, the end of the program, so I'd like to give each and every one of you the opportunity to have a closing statement. Uh, Mr. Owen, we'll start with you. Uh, just uh, two remarks. Um, when uh, Professor Frisch says that, uh, Ira that uh, Jordan has always been hostile to Iran, he means, presumably, after Khomeini took over. Yes, yes, because course. during, during uh, the reign of the Shah, the Shah was one of the protectors of uh, Jordan. And who knows, maybe uh, someone like the Shah will come back and then the Shiite-Sunni uh, rivalry will not be so important. Um, the other thing is that the, uh, the security belt in southeastern uh, Syria, which we mentioned, is also meant to protect Jebel Druze, Sueda, because uh, this will block the movement of the Iranian-backed militias from Iraq towards this part of Syria. Mm -hmm. um, Jordan shares a strategic interest with Israel in southern Syria, as, uh, as I think um, it was explained here. And, um, and the other thing is Putin. The the, one of the reasons that, uh, that the Jordanians are close to Putin is the hope that Putin extricates Syria from Iran's um, very heavy hand. Yep. I'm, I, I don't think that they'll succeed. Putin will succeed, but um, they're hoping that that's Dr. that Bums. will be the case. It, it was said that in the last few years we have seen many presidents go, and somehow the kings have stayed. And it was said just a few minutes ago that uh, perhaps the new president or the new king in the United States have some affinity to kings. So I would just hope uh, that this affinity will remain. There is some logic for why this had uh, happened. And we want to wish success uh, to the king that will continue in a wise way to try and bring stability to this region. Well, this is all the time that we have for today. So I'd like to thank you, Professor Frisch and Mr. Owen, for coming here today. Dr. Baum, to you as well. Thank you so very much. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we will see you next time. TV7 Israel's mission is to give you, our viewers, truthful information, which in effect will give you a chance to really understand what is happening in Israel and its region. If you are blessed by our programs and believe our mission to be important, we urge you to support us and become a voice for Israel. You can support us by going to our website at tv7israelnews.com. This program was made possible through your donations.